This is a really interesting morning as I begin. Uh, John preaches through the Sermon on the Mount out of Matthew, and I come in and I preach out of, I've been preaching out of 2 Corinthians for many months. Um, and we preach what it says, and we're trying to, trying to bring out what the scriptures say. And uh, I'm in a section, chapter 8 and 9, that is, is different than everything else. It's kind of like he's been talking, and it's almost like it's a separate message that he does in 8 and 9, and then he changes again. They're all tied, but this part is really interesting. So, my next four messages are going to be on uh, the grace of God through giving. Because that's what's coming out of uh, 8 and 9. And I don't know if you've got a slide of the kind of where it's coming out. You're going you're to see it over really five months. So today, then again in November, then December, and then in January. So uh, I do encourage you to read 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 on your own. Work through it. Uh, there are some really good practical things to learn there. And we're going to do something really unique this morning unique to Vintage Faith Church, but uh, maybe to you as well. Uh, this, this morning we're going to give you an opportunity, and, and it's really, I, I, I will say it's the grace of God that brought these two events together, me preaching out of 2 Corinthians 8, but also a situation that was brought to our attention in the country of, the, of Ethiopia. And some of you will know this, some may not, but we have a, uh, another church using this building on Saturday afternoons from Ethiopia. And many of the uh, young people that were going to school here um, were part of our church, and then they formed one that, that met uh, in, the, in their own language. And uh, so we have a connection with Ethiopia through them. And we just happened to be talking with them, and we, we found out more about the situation there. Uh, one uh, UN report that I saw, it was actually from June of this year, it said this, it says, the hunger emergency in Ethiopia is the most severe in the world right now and can best be described as mass starvation. Now, the people that we know and their hometown is, is in Gaza. It's, it's not, the northern part is in war, and the southern part's in famine of Ethiopia. And so the combination there is creating a, an incredible uh, major problem in the northern region. The people we know are down from the, more the central region, so it's not quite this severe. They don't have the war aspect. But you also know that distribution of of food is one of the biggest issues, and so w once they get some food there, by the way, the, the war in Ukraine is impacting grain shipments there. I mean, it's just massive things coming against them. Again, famine, drought, and war. Um, we have as a church, and I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago, we have, uh, out of our benevolence fund, we sent $2,000 last week to the, the church in Ga, in that area uh, that, that our that our connections are with. We just sent $2,000 for immediate relief just to help if there's any way that that could be helpful. Now, what's interesting too is we, we have a, a person that we know here in town that's part of an organization that was actually on his way to Ethiopia the next week. We got the two together, us and, and, a, and a friend from the Ethiopian church and also this guy who's going down there. And so he's gonna visit that region. So it was very interesting, the timing of all this. Um, so again, we sent uh, $2,000 down there from the church's benevolence fund, and what I got on the chair is a pledge form for you, okay? And I'm going to explain this more as we go through this morning. What we would like you to do is we would like you to consider how much you would give to Ethiopia into this relief fund, and specifically what this money is going to go for is for grain to be planted as well as for training to, because we're not just trying to give them food, but also help them to, 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 to grow it. And part of why some of them are here studying in agriculture is to learn how to better grow crops. Okay? And so basically we're trying to help that, um, that process, not just eating, but also creating some established methods of, of farming there, as well as the seed to plant. Okay? And we're going to send that money to them in March which is be about the time they're ready to plant just before their rainy season again. Okay? Now, that's complicated. What we're wanting is for you to write down on this form over the next week or two, fill it out, and put it in the box back in the back just to communicate to us how much you are all willing to give to them in, in before, between now and February so we can send it to them in March. And then we will communicate that, that amount 
to them, so they know how much is coming in, Feb in, in March. Okay, is that complicated? It's really simple. Basically, you just tell us how much you're, gonna, you're willing to give, we'll communicate it to them, and then in March we'll send it. Now, the reason we're doing it like this is because that's similar to what happened in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. Okay, and that's what's coming out in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Okay, so bear with me as we go through this morning and you'll see how these two tie together. We're trying to use the opportunity that's right now in, in, our, in our midst, which uh, you know, I just think it's amazing how it's all happened uh, to be aware of this. Um, but we want to learn from God's Word with practical application. Okay? So turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to read just the first 12 verses, and that's what we're going to work from today. And again, remember, keep in mind, we're going to be doing four sermons over eight and nine. So go ahead and read ahead in your own study time. But today, 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 12, it says this, Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in, great, in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. For this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So we urge Titus that, he had, that as he had previously made a beginning, so he would also complete in you this gracious work as well. But just as you abound in everything, by, in faith and utterance and in knowledge and in all earnestness, in the love that we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. I am not speaking this as a command, but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love also. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. I give my opinion in this matter, for this is to your advantage, who were the first to begin a year ago, not only to do this, but also to desire to do it, but now finish doing it also, so that just as there was a readiness to, to desire it, so there may be also the completion of it by your ability. For it is, if the readiness is present, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Now, the topic of today, the wording I have for today, is grace and ability. So the grace of God through giving by ability. Now, I don't know where each of you are. Just bringing up collection and money in the church, I don't know what that does to you. Me, personally, it would be like ye yellow or red flags because I've seen misuse of finances in churches. Maybe you have too. Let me give you an example. And, and this is, this is, I'm trying to do this to give you an idea of where I'm coming from personally so that I can remove, if possible, any stumbling blocks that you may have. To, to, for me to propose a pledge is like crazy. Because when I was, when I was eight years old, uh, I stopped going to church. Okay? Because when I was about six, my dad stopped going to church. And the reason he stopped going, or at least the reason he told me that he stopped going, it was because their church did a fundraiser and they did pledges. Okay? And he was on a committee to go to the people who had not yet fulfilled their pledge. Okay? So what they did is they would take your pledge, and so you guys tell us how much we're, you're going to give, and then if you don't give it, we're going to go knock on your door and say, hey, you need to give it. And that was such a stumbling block to my dad that he said, I'm done. This is a bunch of hypocrisy. I'm out of here. And so from that point on, we didn't go to, or he didn't go to church. And then it wasn't long after that, my brother and I didn't go either. Okay? And Jesus was not really talked about in our home. And then I came to believe in Jesus Christ when I was 24. Okay? So, so give, I, I understand these stumbling blocks. Why am I doing this? Because it's in Scripture. And I, I'll, tell, I'll give you more things. Uh, I'm, uh, I've been a, a pastor here for 11 years, and I do not take any money from this church. Okay? I, I'm not paid. I'm not a staff. Don't, don't get any benefit from it. We don't take an offering. Have you noticed that? We've never taken an offering here. We've got a box in the back. If you want to give, you put it in the box if you want to. 
We try to downplay because we do not want money to be a stumbling block to you. But guess what? It's in scripture everywhere. <laughs> so we want to learn from it. And I hope, I hope that you will, you will come this morning. And as you're looking at Corinthians, you'll look at yourself, God, what do you want to teach me? And I'll try to bring some of those things out this morning because I can freely offer to you the gospel of grace of God. All right, that's what's exciting about this morning. Join me in prayer. Father, thank you for this food of your word. <laughs> it is it's just good and nourishing to us. I pray, Father, that you'll, you'll nourish us with it, that, that our, the, the, the soil of our heart is, is just plowed up, ready for your seed to be planted and bear much good fruit. I pray, Father, you'll, you'll really do a work. Help us to see through all the, all the things that can mess us up and stumble us. And help us to true, truly see your heart and, and even examine ours, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, to your glory, we pray. And we lift up your names in praise. Amen. All right, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at just a few things from history. Okay, because in the Bible, this is not the first thing. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, you guys may know this, where it says, and all the believers were together, right after the day of Pentecost, and all the believers together, and they had all things in common, and they would sell their property and possessions and share them with all to the extent that any had need. Okay, so this is not a new thing. This started the, really the beginning of the church, where they would basically be in a community like this, and we, yeah, we see needs. Okay, I've got something, I'll sell it, and I'll help you with your need. Okay, so we see that there. In Acts chapter 11, basically what you're seeing is the prophecy of I think what's going on in Jerusalem at the time that, that Paul's writing about. Acts chapter 11 verse 28 through 30 it says one of them named Agabus he's a prophet he stood up and began to indicate by the spirit that there would certainly be a famine all over the world and this took place in the reign of Claudius and in the proportion that any of the disciples had mean each one of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. Judea is the region where Jerusalem is, okay? And they did this, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul, Paul, okay? So this is talking about what we're reading in Corinthians. Romans refers to it as well. He says, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. And then in 1 Corinthians, okay, remember, we're, we're reading in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians was written in the fall. In the spring, Paul wrote, a, wrote the first the letter of 1 Corinthians, and it says in 1 Corinthians 16, it says this, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you are to do as well on the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections need to be made when I come. When I arrive, whomever you approve, I will send them with letters to take your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is appropriate for me to go also, they will go with me. Okay, do you see this? What do you, and this is what we're doing right now. This is, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to create a practical picture of what's going on here. What we're asking you to do personally is start setting aside and saving. So that come March, we won't have to take collection, we'll just send it. Okay, you, you get that, why I'm doing some of these things here. So you can personally set aside and save, or you can, you can put it in the box with, you know, with a, a saying it's going to Ethiopia, and we'll just hold it on to it until then. That's fine, however you want to do it. But we're trying to encourage this kind of thing. What Paul was encouraging Corinthians, we're trying to encourage you to do. Because I want you to learn what, they're, what, what he wanted him, them to learn. All right? All right, the situation they were in, okay, we've got poor um, people, poor saints specifically in Jerusalem. And they're not just poor, but they're, they're needing basic needs. And, and because of the famine, there's food issues. This is, this is basic needs that are going on. We're looking at Ethiopia, we're looking at the same type of thing. We're not just trying to, trying to increase their standard of living, we're trying to help them with basic needs. Keep that in mind. But there are other reasons we might do a fundraiser, right? You guys ever been a part of a fundraiser? I would bet we all have. Okay? There could be things like missionary work. Right? We were, we were praying for Russell and Justine. There's a possibility they'll be going to, uh, overseas for a long period of time. There might be an opportunity for, for support of a missionary. It's a good thing to do. Uh, building a building is probably one of the most common things, right? We actually helped the Ethiopian church build their church, current church building about a year and a half ago. Okay? Um, disaster relief is one of the common things going on. Uh, education to create a scholarship might do that. You might also get into something like, you know, save the whales or something. There is no lack of opportunity to give, right? No lack. There, there, there are 
people raising funds for everything, everywhere. So, what we're doing is trying to figure out how to get into this heart thing that's going on. And if you think about it, what's the difference between philanthropy and Christian giving? It's all in the heart. Philanthropy, you know, you're trying to, to do something to, to promote a cause, and sometimes there may be other motives. I want to promote my business, give my business a good name. But in Christian giving, it has other things. Remember Sermon on the Mount, when John's been preaching out there, it's been there, right? In John, Matthew chapter 6, it says this, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret. Right? That's different. That's a Christian type of giving, right? You're not trying to do it to get accolades. But Scripture balances one another, too. Think about Matthew 5, 16. It says, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And that's something you see here in 1 Corinthians 8, or 2 Corinthians 8. See, the Corinthians pledged, if you will, to give to Jerusalem. The Macedonians saw it, and they were encouraged to give to the to the Jerusalem. And by them giving to Jerusalem, Paul is using their giving as an encouragement to the Corinthians to give it. You see, again, it, there was, it was visible, but it was right in the heart. It wasn't just to get, hey, look at me, I'm good, but it was actually do something that God has moved in them. And Matthew 6, 19 says, do, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth, but store for yourselves treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, and that's what we're getting at. We're trying to look in our heart. And that's what I'm hoping that will happen today, is you'll start <laughs> diving into your heart a little bit more on this idea of how, how generous are you? How's it working? There, there are seven players in this, in this passage here in 2 Corinthians 8. There's Jerusalem, okay? They're in need. You have basic needs. Corinthians, they're the ones who have said they were going to give, and now he's saying, okay, go ahead and give now. You said you were going to give it, go, go ahead and get it done. Uh, now, one thing that, that's not in this passage, but it'll show up, is what might be hindering them from giving is they have been hearing bad things about Paul. Okay? And even to the point where maybe he's not handling your money properly. Okay? And, and, and so keep that in mind. That's not going to show up here. It'll show up a little bit more later. But one of the things they've been hearing is, so they said they were going to send money to Jerusalem, and now this Paul guy who's kind of organizing all this, he sounds questionable. Okay? But he's saying, he, he's trying to help them get past that and go ahead and do, their, do what they said they'd do. Okay? Whether through him or not. And that's going to show up even more later on. All right. Titus, or excuse me, Macedonians. The Macedonians are going to be used as an example to the Corinthians. Because they, they heard about the Corinthians giving, and then they went ahead and gave. Okay, by the way, Macedonians are just north of Corinth, and those are the churches of Philippi, uh, Thessalonica, and Berea. Okay, so these are significant churches in the, in the writing here. Okay? Important people that really moved. And he boasted about them, Paul did. He boasted greatly about the way that they were moved to give beyond their ability. And we're just talking about giving according to our ability is what we're talking about. Now, there's a guy named Titus in here. I, I like this, and he's just going to be a little hint in this part, but if you read more, you're going to see more. And, and I wonder which one of you is going to be a Titus. Okay? Because Titus has been to Jerusalem, and now he's going to Corinthians to encourage them, and he's part of Paul's ministry, and he's, try, he, he, and he's not just in, in, connected to the ministry, but he has a heart for the need, for the, for the people in Jerusalem, but he also has a heart for the people in Corinth. So which one are you going to be the Titus in our story, in our living it out? Who's going to Ethiopia? Who's going to be a, a runner of this? Who's going to be care, caring about both sides, the heart of us, as well as the needs of other people? I, I thought that was an amazing piece that just kind of is underlying all this other stuff. By the way, the, the, the conversation about the people in Jerusalem in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, he doesn't really even talk about how bad it is. It's just not there. It's like it's not even the main point. There's, there's something that's happening. You're giving money to the, to, the, to the saints in Jerusalem because they have a need, but that's really not the point. There's a lot of other things, and most of it's in the heart of the Corinthians is what he's addressing. Another big player in here in this passage? <laughs> Jesus. Surprise, surprise, right? Major. Look for it. As we, I'll, go, as we go through, I'll bring it out. But Jesus is a perfect example of what he's talking about. 
But there's other people. Remember, we talked about being a light on a hill. We're watching. There's other people watching, whether they be other Christians or non-Christians, that are watching what's going on. And of course, God. Because it's the grace of God that's at work. It's not just money moving around, but the grace of God is moving around. And God is the one who ultimately is going to get the thanks and the praise. It's just, it's just cool. Um, there are three things I want to bring out about the Macedonians. Look at it in verse 1 through 5. Now I'm just going to reread it. Now, brothers and sisters, we make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in, great ordeal, in a great ordeal of affliction and abundance of joy and their deep poverty, it overflowed in a wealth of liberality. Isn't that cool? Think about that. They're, they're afflicted. They're in lots of trouble themselves, but there's some joy that's inside them that creates a liberality. They give a lot based on what they have. And it's coming from that joy. It's, it's pretty cool. Verse 3, it says, For I testify that according to their ability, ability and beyond their ability, we're going to talk about that practically in a little bit, and they gave, that they gave voluntarily, begging us for the... Um, with, with, uh, with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this, not as we have expected, but they first gave themselves. So, so they're, you know, have you ever been around a fundraiser and they're just kind of making you guilty or they're trying to get you pumped up or they're doing whatever, they're kind of getting on this bandwagon. Come on, join us. That wasn't necessary here of the Macedonians. They were begging to be a part of it because of joy coming out of them. Oh, I think that's, that's cool. Now, I don't know if that's what's going on in you, okay? That's not natural in me, right? There's going to have to be some move of God in us for that to happen. That, that is, that's cool. But he, and, he, and I think the key here is that they first gave themselves. They first gave themselves to the Lord and to Paul. And then they were able to enter in with joy. It's, 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 a, it's a cool thing that we're looking at, what's going on in the heart. Uh, Think about, remember the, the, the poor widow who gave the, the mite or two cents or whatever it is? And, and Jesus said this, he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. For they put in out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty put in all that she owned, all that she had to live on. And the point is, it's not the quantity of the dollars. And I think that's always the this, this story here in, in this widow. It's not the amount of money you're given. It's what's going on in the heart. And that's what Paul's talking about. And that's, hopefully you'll get this, that's what I'm talking about. All right, so generosity is a heart issue. Here's 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each one must do just as he has decided in his heart. Okay, so, so we're asking you to examine your heart. But it, it's a hard issue, but it's also a practical issue. In 2 Corinthians 8.12, it says, For the, if willingness is present, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what, you, what he does not have. So the question is, what do you have? Right? So it's a practical issue. You're not expected or even cons, you know, urged or encouraged to, by God to give anything that you don't have. Only what's what you're, what you're able to give. Okay, so that's helpful. Ephesians 4, 28 says, The one who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, producing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one in need. Right? We, we get this. Okay, stop, stop, stop stealing. Right? We get that. But he goes farther. He says, stop stealing and work, not just to provide for your needs, but so that you can provide for somebody else's needs. Now, do we in America typically have that thought? I'm going to get a job so that I can meet my basic needs and meet the basic needs of other people. We don't typically do that. Sometimes we do in a family setting. And, I'll, and, and we all understand that the closer people are, the easier it is to help them, right? So sending this to Jerusalem or to Ethiopia is a little more difficult than helping one of you. Okay? We, we understand those things. These are really practical things. So as I said, it's a hard thing, it's a practical thing, but it's also a grace of God thing. In 8.1 he says, Now, brothers and sisters, we make known to you the grace of God. God is not absent from this. This is not just a dollars and cents, help them type of thing. This is a God movement is what's happening here. Especially you see it in Macedonia. And God, and he's, he's, but, it, but it's not without participation because that's when, when he's urging Corinth to do this, he's urging them to participate with the grace of God. This is a cool thought. All right, when we think about the grace of God and salvation, 
But do you think about God, grace of God in other things, like money moving? <laughs> I, I love second, or Titus 2. Women got together this past week, focusing on Titus 2, and, and his great passage there. But the second half of this starts in verse 11. It says this, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. We get that. That's what we usually think about when we think about grace. But it says, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. That's what we're talking about. When it looks practical, practical we're talking about money movement, if you're helping one another, is God's grace in us living sensibly and righteously and godly. Grace of God shows up in a lot of places. Okay? All right, I'm going to get super, super, super practical here. All right, I got, a, I got a, a slide here that is the way we normally think in America. We get income come in, and we get this income comes in, and the bucket that goes into is our needs. Okay, we're trying to meet our needs by getting a job and having money come in. Okay, that's the typical thinking, right? When you're first, I don't know, okay, when I was first got, a, got my first job, that's all I'm thinking. I just need to meet my needs. Here's a little more practical look at it is this one is we really have needs, but we have a lot of wants. And I'll give you one assignment. Take some time and analyze or just discern in your life, what are my wants and what are my needs? What's, where's the, where are my needs? What are really needs and what are really wants? I will tell you that for, for natives and my finances over the years, that is the most fundamental, foundational, helpful thing we ever did, is just discern between those two things. Okay, and it's amazing. And you notice I got needs pretty small. That's what you'll find. Start, start determining it. It's amazing. Paul says, if I have food and clothing with this, I will be content. Those are some powerful, powerful passages. Now, so, so go there, but, but one of the questions that a Christian will ask is, what about the tithe? And I want to show a bucket here. This is really the idea from a Christian standpoint. And think about it as a bucket. When you pour water into a bucket, it fills from the bottom up. And think that way. Because God says he wants the first fruits. And that's the idea, is that you'd, you'd, you'd pay your tithe. And, and from an Old Testament standpoint, the tithe was there to, to pay for the, uh, the things of the temple. It was to help the, meet all the needs of the Levites and all that stuff. Okay, So basically the temple. The practicality of that, tithe comes in, it goes in the box, and gets used for the church. Okay, Very, very common practice. All right? But let me say something that's really important. The tithe is not an indication of your generosity. The tithe is an indication or an, uh, an, an, an acknowledgement of ownership. The tithe is there to say God owns everything. And he says, I want the first tenth. Okay? That's different than what we're talking about. In the Old Testament, talk about tithes and offerings. We're, today in 2 Corinthians, we're really talking about these offerings. Where does that come from? Now, before we get too far, I'm going to jump back even to the beginning where I said, this is not a command. I'm not telling you what to do. Paul says it here in verse 8. He says, I am not saying this is a command, but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love as, all, as well. The idea, remember we're talking about loving God. That's what we wanted you to do. So what's God saying about money? And, and how are you responding to Him? And then we say, how do you love others? Because that, that's God's command to you, is how do you love others? This is not a command from me, and Paul says it's not a command from him. And the reason I say that, and I think is the same thing, is I do not want you to, to wrestle with this issue because I said so. I, I very rarely will tell anybody what to do because I don't want you to try to obey me. I'm going to bring some things up because I want you to wrestle with God. I want you to obey God. I want you to serve Him. And I'm going to help along the way. It is not about me at all, or, or even Paul in this case. It's a free will. And God is even saying that. Come before me freely. This is also an integrity thing. Remember, the, the Corinthians had said they would send money to Jerusalem. And now he's coming back and saying, okay, you said you were going to send it. Now send it. And, and I, there's a passage that's helped me out of, out of Psalm 15. It says this, and I'll summer, kind of merge it all together. It says, O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? He who walks with integrity and works righteousness. And he says, he swears to his own hurt and changes not. Which means, I swore that I would give it, and it hurts. It's going to cost me something, but I'm going to go ahead and give it anyway. I'm not going to change my mind. I'm going to keep my word. That kind of thing. All right? The idea is, I'm going to swear to my own hurt, I'm going to say I'm going to do something, 
and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. If I say to you, Lord, that I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do it. And that's why, keep in mind, and I'm gonna, I'll reiterate this, this is no small thing. Because you're not just making some, you know, writing some number down. You, you are making a pledge or a vow or a promise to God. And, and, and God expects you to keep it. So that's why what I'm s- suggesting <laughs> is no small thing. All right. There's an important piece here in, in 2 Corinthians 8. Because you guys are all, and I know most of you, you are godly people. You have incredible gifts and abilities and you, you work them out. And that's what he says here in, in verse 7. He says, but just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speaking, in knowledge, and in earnestness, and in the love we inspired in you, see that you also excel in this gracious work. I am not saying this is a command, but proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love as well. Do you get that? He's saying you're already really godly in lots of ways. I want you to excel in this one, this gracious work, this work of grace also. Okay? And here's, the, here's where, where Paul, I think, brings everything into perspective, is in verse 9. In verse 9 he says this, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Now, now let me ask you, you who have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you, have, you who have been washed of your sins, you have, who have been given the eternal inheritance, do you realize how rich you are? And what Paul's bringing out here is, do you realize what Jesus did to make you rich? He left eternal riches and became poor to make you rich. And and what that does, the the context of this is saying, wow, it puts everything in perspective. Everything I own, everything I'm going to get, every need that's around me, it puts it in that perspective. And and that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to to let us realize that this is not just a physical issue. It is an eternal spiritual conversation. He's wanting our heart. God is always after our heart. Not our money, right? Philippians 2, 6 says this, although he existed in the form of God, talking about Jesus, he did not require or regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of men, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Is God calling you to be poor to help the poor? We'll talk about that in coming weeks. Okay, it'll come up. It really does. Um, but, I, but this passage, this, this one about Jesus, puts everything in perspective. It's really good. All right. Remember we said there's no guilt, this is not a command, that's, that's the idea. But he says in verse 10, I give my opinion in this matter. Paul is doing that, and this is what I'm doing right here. I give my opinion in this matter, uh, for this is to your advantage. What I'm talking about is to your advantage. There's something about what, what, he's, what he's talking about. These physical things of giving money to help people is to your advantage. Keep that in mind. Uh, and then he goes on to say it's based on your ability. Now, I want to add to the, the, the chart I, I gave up a little bit because what we're talking about is given according to our ability, and it shows up this way. And I, I use the word margin. You can come up with that, whatever word. But when we talk about ability, you, you know we have the tithe, we got the needs. Th- those are not ability. Those are needs, right? But, but you get up in standard of living or wants, that's where our ability to give is. And so we have two choices. We either increase our income so that we can keep our standard of living where it is, our wants where they are, and then create some some margin to be able to give away, right? That's the person who's stealing. He's He's gonna stop stealing, he's gonna start, get a job, he's gonna be able to meet his needs, and then he's gonna have some to give away. Well, if you're in a situation, you got an income of some sort, just increase your income, 
right? Just to increase your income, and whatever the increase of that income is, give that away. I was, I was confronted with that just recently because I had a job opportunity that I could take that would cause me a lot of work. Right? Sounds great, right? Well, I, that's a lot of money. Wow. The thought was, well, why don't we just give it all away? And you go, oh, wait a minute, all of it? I don't know. These are the types of things that you're going you're gonna to run into in your heart when you start getting pushed on some of this stuff. But I want you to be pushed by God. Now, the other thing you can do is reduce your standard of living. Now, Nate and I have, have, have worked with a lot of people on their, on their budget and finances and stuff like that, because there, there's, you know, you can get really upside down in, in life pretty easy. And what I like about now, this, this standard of living, there are so many things in the standard of living that are easily removed. I, mean, I can probably get $100 extra in your paycheck every, every month pretty easily, because, <laughs> man, there's, there's monthly charges on this uh, you know, online streaming or this music or this TV or what, this is telephone, it's, it's crazy. I'm, I'm making light of that a little bit. But what I'm getting at is if, if you're trying to respond to God's call, this is where it's going to cost you. Because when we talk about sacrificial giving, any giving is sacrificial. Do you understand that? If the money is, in you, is yours and you give it away, that is sacrificial. Some people make it, you know, it's got to, got to hurt. No, it doesn't. Any money you give away is sacrificial. But when the, and, and so when you're given according to your ability, you're given out of that margin, or not just the margin, but you've created margin in your wants. And that's what you're giving away. That's your ability. Okay? What the, what the Macedonians did is they gave beyond their ability. What that means is they gave not just their standard of living, their wants, they gave down into their needs. That's, that's far more sacrificial, isn't it? This is, this is amazing. Let me give you give me some other, just a brief guy's name. Here's a, here's a picture of something, a, a guy, R.G. Letourneau. You guys ever seen one of these things around the, the country? Working up on the highways or other places? When you see one of those, think of a guy who is considered, he, he got the byword named God's businessman because he's known for giving away 90% of his income. Now, you can... Yeah, just think about it every time you see one of those. Wow, this guy gives it. So when we think about when we think about February into March, I'm going to throw this numbers thing up there, right? Maybe you've seen this, something like this. If you give seventy-five dollars, you know you can help one person. What I want you to think about is what's your ability. What is your ability? Is your ability seventy-five dollars, or is your ability seven hundred fifty dollars, or seven thousand five hundred, or seventy-five thousand, or seven hundred fifty thousand? Because in this room, this little child, what ability does she have to give? Nothing, right? She can't give any of that money. Maybe everybody in this room can give $75. If you, if you say between now and March 1st, I'm going to come up with $75. We probably all can do that. That's probably fit all of our ability. Okay? Some of us may have to work for it, may not have 75, may have to work for it. Same thing with 750. The point is, where, do not compare yourself to somebody else. When God is looking at your ability, and He wants you to be generous out of that ability, think about it. And what is He calling you to do? So let, me, let me just summarize some of these things that we've talked about. We're talking about God is, is interested in us having a generous heart. That we're not stingy and, and just trying to hold on to things or greedy. And, and the, my encouragement is to examine your heart with these things. Uh, some of this takes some preparation. <laughs> Does it sound like great? I mean, can you think about working out your salvation requires some preparation, meaning build margin in your life? That was helpful in my life when somebody brought up that idea. So that's part of why I'm passing on. Maybe you just need to stop stealing and get a job. Maybe, maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you need to evaluate the difference between needs and wants. Okay, huge thing. Um, this pledge, I want you to realize, it becomes a debt. As soon as you say, I will give X dollars, it becomes something you owe. It, and that is not something I encourage, trust me. But in this case, I, th I think it can help us learn what, what God's wanting us to learn. Um, so be... Be, um, 
<laughs> introspective. Think about that and take it before the Lord if you decide to, to write something down. Remember why we're doing this. All we're doing is trying to give them a number so they know how much is coming. That's the only reason we're doing it. But when you say it, it becomes something much more than that to you, between you and God. All right, keep your word. If you say you're gonna do something, finish it, which is what Paul's telling the Corinthians. And practice. This idea, you may not be good at this. And some of us have been Christians a lot longer. We should be good at it. <laughs> I think it's something we have to practice ongoing because we can say, oh, I've done well and I've got a kind of a comfortable uh, uh, working out of this. But God wants us to continue to grow in all these things. We read passages out of uh, first Peter and, or second Peter and out of, uh, out of Psalms this morning and talking about growing in things. And that's where it's, where it's at. Um, discern motives. Look at your heart and say, what's going on? Am I greedy, stingy, am I generous? but also discern the motives of others. There are people out there just trying to scam me out of stuff, right? It's just a pity story. You know, the Bible says if they will not work, they should not eat. Okay, some people are just lazy, all right? You, there's discernment in all these, these things that we're talking about. Um, give yourself to the Lord first. Don't give your money if you haven't given your Lord. Don't, don't just keep it does you no good, it's, it's of no value. If you have not given yourself to the Lord, just keep it. And, and then recognize the grace of God. Just recognize it for what it is. If you see somebody giving to somebody else, wow, the grace of God is moving there. If you are a recipient of help at some point, recognize that did not just come from that person. That is the grace of God moving. And give him his rightful praise. Is, is a wonder, wonderful thing. This is very, very practical and it probably is very uneasy because I know it is for me even to prepare it. It's been very personally uneasy. But let God's word do a work in you. Okay? Go and read 2 Corinthians in, uh, 8 and 9. I'll, I'll come back to it as I said. Uh, but may somehow you allow God to bless you through this. 